Hi. How's everyone doing? Had enough conference yet? We've got a lot Almost. more for you. So, yeah. uh, so today we're going to talk uh, a little bit about, uh, yeah, for any of you who happen to be at the demo Palooza and saw us do some of this kind of stuff in about two minutes flat, now we're going to tell you how it really works. So we're going, to talk, we're going to look at various ways in which we can use some of the big data technologies in our platform, some of the things that we've built on top of that, uh, some of the community pieces, and then some of the ecosystem pieces around that that we've built to start to create solutions that catch hackers in action. We're also going to talk about how we visualize that and uh, investigate uh, attacks as well, and uh, yeah, show you a uh, couple of things. Firstly, some, uh, some more of that live attack demo that we saw uh, yesterday but also a little bit more detail about how you would do a fine-grained, uh, detailed investigation on an individual as well. So, my name's Simon Ellison Ball. Uh, I'm a product manager at Hortonworks. I look after our cybersecurity offerings. Uh, my background is essentially in data science. Uh, I've been herding the Hadoop elephant for some time now. Uh, I think it's probably about to seven or so years now, but I'm not really counting. I don't have enough uh, you know, data technology to tell me how long I've been on this sort of <laughs> stuff. And uh, this right here is uh, a very cute little uh, origami elephant that lives in our London offices. I kind of really like this elephant as a metaphor for yeah, the way that the whole uh, yeah, Hadoop ecosystem works, because uh, anyone can take a bunch of stuff, or anyone can take a piece of paper and fold it up a couple of times. But without the right kind of frameworks, without the right kind of guidance, and without the instructions, it's very difficult to make something as cool and beautiful as that. So in many ways, it's like, you know, the, you know, it, it represents for me the way in which we provide frameworks and provide distributions <coughs> and provide packages and are around the ecosystem of projects to bring them together to provide something which is actually, well, yeah. Usually we go for more useful than pretty in that case, but hopefully today we can also show you some things that are pretty as well. Great, and hi, I'm Justin Langseth. I'm founder of Zoom Data. Uh, I was uh, kind of been in the business intelligence and data warehousing space. It's kind of what we used to call big data before somebody came up with that term. So we've been in that space for a long time, uh, and have gotten into big data and streaming data, and uh, we're excited to be partnering with Hortonworks uh, around Metron and uh, show you some uh, cool stuff today. And I'm not an elephant herder, and I don't have an origami elephant. Um, but the reason I started Zoom Data was to really empower us as humans to kind of do things that AI and machine learning won't ever hopefully be able to do. And uh, us as humans with unique visual cortices and other kind of things that we can do in terms of pattern recognition that AI is at least so far can't do, uh, I kind of want Zoom Data to be the thing that us humans use to kind of watch what's happening in the AIs and uh, su supervise them to the extent we can do that for some period of time and uh, keep, us, uh, keep us in the loop in the future. So it's kind of what we're doing here in this Metron example is there's a lot of AI and machine learning and all kinds of fancy stuff happening underneath Metron, but we want to make that exposed to humans so we can A, understand what's going on, and then B, also keep an eye on it to make sure it's staying on the rails. So that's what I'm all about. So we, we will also be showing you one of the most advanced neural networks available to mankind. Uh, <laughs> Simon's head. Supported by... <laughs> <coughs> supported by uh, yeah, so, so much more, uh, much simpler machine learning. Yep. So why are we doing this in the first place? There are a couple of things I want to point out about the cybersecurity world. First off, how many of you would consider yourselves cybersecurity people in this room or infosec people if you've been in it for a while? Okay. And how many of you are more kind of big data type, yeah, data science type people? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So for all the people who maybe yeah, who are in cybersecurity, you already know that you've been under attack for years and that it's difficult and that there is a whole community of people up against you. Uh, the industry in general has only really just started to realize that it's time to stop competing with each other uh, and little vendors competing on tiny little point solutions have started to realize that it's time to come together because the attackers are coming together as well. They're also operating quite big businesses on this. Uh, yeah, no one quite knows how big the, uh, yeah, the, the business of criminal cybersecurity is because, well, you know what? They don't publish their results in quarterly reports. Uh, but most estimates put it well into the kind of trillion dollar market of what's being, yeah, what's being made in terms of yeah, things like fraud, things like botnet sales. Uh, we're also seeing, and uh, yeah, one of the things 
or one of the big problems is that there's a lot of collaboration in this community. There are whole markets of access in this community and markets for things like accounts. You know, I've got an example there from a recent report from, I think that, uh, was that KPMG or BT or something like that, uh, where they're finding LinkedIn accounts for sale, so authentication credentials for sale uh, at about a rate of 100 million accounts for uh, five Bitcoin. Anyone collecting Bitcoin and are nervously looking at the price right now? 6,300. That's about, it's, it's about 6K-ish. Yeah. Yeah, so that's about 30K for 100 million people's details. That's full account credentials. Yeah. That's, that's kind of cheap, right? Anyone in marketing, wouldn't you love to be able to buy that list? <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Don't. Put it that it's way. illegal. Um, the other thing that we see is we see people kind of building up these botnets and yeah, uh, a lot of organizations will sort of say, well, you know, I'm really worried about people stealing my information, but they should also be worrying about people stealing their resources because people are building up these botnets and then essentially kind of reselling them uh, for access to perform uh, yeah, DDoS type attacks. They're looking at uh, yeah, reselling these things almost like cloud services. So you're essentially getting this development of criminality as a service. Uh, and if you look at some of the recent DDoS attacks, for example, which have been, uh, and the services that are sold on this, the rates are ludicrously cheap. And yeah, it costs about $5 an hour to launch a DDoS attack that can take down a major corporation. And yeah, the people trying to defend this are spending an average of about $40,000 an hour to try and keep these people out. Now, this is just not something that's sustainable for an individual organization to keep doing. So we have to collaborate as a community to solve some of these problems. I mean, seriously, if I could buy AWS services at the kind of rates at which I could buy botnet services if I were so inclined, then, yeah, we, we would all be running 10,000 node clusters all the time. Can we run the clusters on the botnets, maybe? Is it? Yeah, maybe we should start using these botnets yeah, for good. There you go. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's way cheaper than most of the cloud providers. Uh, turns out it's really, really cheap to run a cloud if you don't have to pay for the electricity, the computer, or the storage. <laughs> it's all profit. So the result of this is that a lot of the security departments uh, yeah, are getting absolutely drowned in the amount of data uh, that's hitting them as well. So they're also, yeah, you're dealing with all the technologies which are designed to deal with maybe hundreds of thousands of events per second. And you know, a lot of, you know, you're dealing with small numbers of people watching these events or prioritizing these events. So it's very difficult to keep up. It's a classic big data problem. So what we've done is produce this uh, reference architecture on top of the HDP and HDF platforms, which we call Apache Metron. So it's a project which developed originally out of a product uh, with Cisco uh, called OpenSOC and has now developed into this a rigid, this, this kind of well-formed, well-tested pipeline for processing cybersecurity data on the big data platforms that I'm sure you've all heard of uh, over the course of the week. Anyone heard of HDP and HDF this week? It's all based on those good, solid pieces. And we have this pipeline for bringing the data in, parsing and normalizing it, enriching it with additional data sources, and then providing things like uh, behavioral analytics through our behavioral profiling technology uh, also applying machine learning models along this pipeline as well, and then indexing that out into a variety of sources, which then enables us to do interesting things with visualization at the other end. So the key to this and the reason that we started doing this was we were starting to see a lot of people going down a kind of DIY route. They saw that big data problem. They saw that their security teams were just unable to cope with the volumes of data created by uh, you know, modern log feeds, for example, modern security devices. And so they went and said, right, we've got a great big data platform for this. We've got BI tools to be able to do this. We'll build it ourselves. And they all ended up doing roughly the same thing. And some of them got quite a long way down this path. Some of them kind of ended up realizing that there was a lot of work, a lot of underlying plumbing to do before you could get to any value. So that's why we've essentially created this reference and this framework to stop people having, to stop every single organization having to do the same things to get their data process. So this gets you to starting at a much higher level than you would with, yeah, just kind of on your own. Uh, and again, that really starts to address some of that economic imbalance that we saw between, you know, the cost of attack versus the cost of defense. By getting together and leveraging this, we can reduce that cost of defense as well. So 
what I'm going to do is this, this, uh, this is essentially a, a platform for ingesting, processing, analyzing, uh, performing machine learning against that platform. What I'm going to do is hand over to Justin to tell you a little bit about how that fits in and feeds for visualization and investigation platform that we're then going to look at. Yep, so, uh, so the output of Metron is a bunch of Kafka feeds, NiFi processes, uh, data stored in solar, data stored in the HDP platform. And we built ZoomData as a modern business intelligence tool that really is optimized for the kind of HDF and HDP uh, technologies, as well as other kind of, uh, any kind of modern data, including graph data, uh, various types of streaming data. And the way that uh, we did this is we, uh, the way Metron treats data as a stream, there's data kind of continuously coming into Metron from sensors and collectors from various uh, cybersecurity devices and network devices. Uh, we also net flows through a stream uh, in Metron and Zoom data treats this also problem also as a stream, but from kind of the opposite direction. If you think about a human uh, being like yourself, uh, you have a stream of consciousness, and your stream of consciousness, when you're starting to analyze data or work with data, uh, leads you to ask different questions and follow-up questions and kind of look, drill down and do things like that. And effectively, what an analyst or a business user is doing is generating a stream of queries uh, as they start to interact with any kind of dashboard or business intelligence system. So what we did at Zoom Data is realize that since the humans are kind of thinking in a stream, we can turn that into a stream of queries. And what we technically do is instead of running one big uh, SQL query against a traditional SQL database when the user clicks something, is we break down each of the user's questions uh, into even smaller queries that we call micro queries. Because each, uh, e each bigger query can be run in smaller pieces. And we run those queries in a stream against the various backend uh, data technologies. And what that lets us do is as the results of those little tiny queries start to come back, we land them into Spark and we start to coalesce the results as more and more of the query uh, results come in. We join that together and then we stream uh, out to the user continuously updating visuals that get basically sharper and sharper the longer they watch them. And but since uh, this, this monitor can only render data to a certain resolution and the human visual cortex can only see to a certain resolution, uh, oftentimes you don't actually have to run the entire query before you give the human the, uh, the answer they're looking for, or at least the impetus to take the next step. If they see that Texas is big, red, and flashing, they might just want to drill down on that, even if it's based on 70 or 95 percent of the query running. Uh, it's unlikely to change uh, with the rest of the query if they waited a few more seconds. So uh, Zoom data, we're always running in a stream, and that also lets us visualize data in real time. Since data is continuously arriving, we're able to visualize it continuously, and that's what I'll show in the dashboard that we're showing built on top of Metron. So we're going to get on to the first use case that we're demonstrating here. And a uh, quick question, does anyone know what this is? It's an IP camera, right? This, this one happens to be stuck to the side of my house. I'm pretty sure it's not a member of a botnet. I'm a little bit security obsessed. Um, <laughs> but to an attacker, this is not an IP camera. This is a fairly powerful CPU with a fast internet connection which can stream uh, full frame high def video at about 30 frames per second. Now that adds up to a fairly decent chunk of traffic. Collect about half a million of those together and rent them out for five bucks an hour and you've got an extremely powerful platform for performing a DDoS. Uh, devices like this one, and again, I'm pretty sure not this one itself, <laughs> um, <coughs> were part of the uh, Mirai botnet, which, uh, yeah, this is, a, this is an interesting one because estimates of how much traffic it produced vary widely. No one quite knows how much traffic it produced at its peak or how many devices were involved in it at its peak. And the estimates, uh, yeah, from various analysts and organizations are, yeah, hugely variable. The kind of Average to topish ones come out about 1.2 terabytes per second of traffic directed against a single target. <coughs> That's actually, that just becomes a sheer volume problem. The other thing that uh, has become interesting is that some of the more sophisticated modern botnets will do things which uh, evade a lot of traditional uh, yeah, prevention and detection devices. They'll do things like pulse that traffic. So yeah, you'll get, um, suddenly you'll get a huge amount of traffic and then nothing and a huge amount of traffic and then nothing, which is more than enough to kill your network infrastructure, but very difficult for traditional machine learning type uh, yeah, algorithms to start to see a consistent pattern. 
You're no longer just looking for, oh, okay, it's all gone up through the roof, start blocking things, it all comes down again. The more sophisticated uh, attacks are starting to need more complex pattern recognition, sequence recognition, some of the kind of machine learning pieces uh, in that as well. So a lot of that starts to need something which uh, also requires human intelligence to see, see these patterns. Because the attackers are getting more sophisticated about the kind of patterns that they're using these uh, networks to attack with, we also need more sophisticated solutions. So some people will tell you that the answer is to go out and spend a quarter of a million dollars on a box full of GPUs to run an advanced neural network, which will probably give you more false positives than yeah, you, you, you can possibly process. What we're going to say is use an even more advanced neural network, supplemented and augmented by machine learning, to be able to catch some of these things. So, uh, Justin, could you please show us your, your very advanced between ear neural network in action. Oh, my, oh yeah, <laughs> sure. Maybe, I'm getting the spinning pen wheel at the moment. Oh, here we go, all right, cool. Um, yeah, so we're gonna show a live demonstration of uh, this kind of botnet scenario. And uh, this is gonna be running through Zoom Data and Metron. And the first thing we'll do is kind of show how the data is set up coming into Metron. So Metron is set up through Mbari. There's neat little UIs that come with it, which Simon is there's a lot more about than I do, but I'll log into this one. Uh, and this is showing us the different kinds of data sets that are being loaded into Metron, and then the processes that are happening on each of these data sets. So this first demo is based on uh, data from an HTTP uh, proxy, so an outbound web pro proxy for an organization running Squid. And so this is data that's coming off a Squid uh, log and being sucked in, right, through, you want to describe it maybe? In yeah, so, <laughs> so what we're doing here is we're using, uh, or we're bringing squid logs in through uh, a NiFi processor, in mm -hmm. fact. So we're using the NiFi file tailing processors at the edge to then pull those squid logs through to a Kafka topic. Uh, what Metron then does is pull those logs off of a Kafka topic, parse them, enrich them, uh, and apply rules and machine learning to them uh, through that. Can, yeah, so there you go. There you got your NiFi. It's pretty simple NiFi. Uh, a more realistic scenario would use a series of NiFi agents around the edge to be able to pull that in from multiple locations, say multiple offices, uh, into mm -hmm. that core NiFi uh, and push that into the Kafka topics. Mm -hmm. What we then have, if we have a look at the Metron configuration, yep. what we then have here is a series of uh, your configuration pieces. So you can either edit this in a fairly simple guided way, uh, yeah, where we can configure, say, the pattern that we use to parse that, uh, your preview of the fields that are coming out of that, uh, that pattern for these squid logs. You see it's picking up some of the recent ones from, uh, you yeah, know, this looks like it's pretty live. Um, Hope so. We can add simple transformations like geo-enrichment and uh, yeah, threat intel type transfers. We're gonna see the result of that threat intel application uh, yeah, there in a second. Uh, we can also look at some of the more advanced type uh, configurations and use cases here and start to see things like transformations of those. So, uh, yeah, we have a series of very network-centric UDFs, essentially, applied yeah, as part of a Metron library to do things like pull apart URLs, pull apart host names, pull apart network IDs, the kind of things that are very relevant to yeah, security use cases. And, uh, yeah, we can also then apply uh, yeah, these uh, triage rules, tri uh, yeah, simple Boolean expressions and scoring expressions to be able to yeah, quantify how much we care about this alert, how important this alert is. And that's all, yeah, that's all configurable either through these JSON configurations here, uh, yeah, through the uh, more guided UI for some of the yeah, simpler, more day-to-day -day use cases, and also, in fact, through a, a scriptable REPL environments as well. So yeah, whatever your personal preferences are, maybe you, maybe you wanted web UI, maybe you really, really, really love the terminal. Uh, you, can use, uh, you can use whatever you like to configure that. Yep, so, uh, so right now going into this system is a, a baseline set of activity. We're simulating kind of traffic from an organization and uh, we're gonna show that in Zoom data here. And uh, what I'm gonna do as I'm bringing up this dashboard is I'm gonna kick off a, a coordinated botnet attack. So right now, before I do that, we can see that uh, this green line represents all the normal traffic in the organization that's not triggering alerts in Metron, and the red is the Metron alerts, which are occasional. And I'm going to go to my uh, special window here, and I'm going to uh, 
log back into my server and kick off a script. Is that too small for people to read? Because that's deliberate. Because that's, my... that's how you hide your credentials during a demo. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I just typed sudo su and it didn't require any credentials. So uh, if you have my pem file, you're in business. So I'm not going to give it to you. Python. All right. So we're going to kick off a uh, script. And what this is going to do is generate additional traffic on top of the uh, baseline traffic. And it's going to start to alter what uh, we perceive as normal here in this dashboard. So as that kicks off, we see that about 4% of the outbound HTTP traffic is generating alerts. Uh, so that's kind of the normal activity. And these alerts are based on Metron finding the outbound traffic to be suspicious in some way. Potentially, it's going to a known bad site, uh, or there's some other kind of uh, issue with it. And that's what Metron, uh, Simon was showing, is set up. So Metron saying some of this traffic is abnormal. You might want to take a look at it. Uh, and then that's a certain percentage. And what is happening now as this attack is uh, starting to kick off is we can start to see that if we look at the tail of this uh, line here, we can see uh, for the minute that's currently building uh, that the uh, traffic still looks pretty normal, but I suspect that we're going to see this uh, red dot here on the right-hand side start to uh, grow pretty quickly compared to the, uh, the green dot. And uh, what we can also see is the uh, target domains. So these are the domains that are triggering the alerts here in this heat map. And we see that there's uh, two domains that are starting to kind of grow and uh, this is all just coming through tick by tick in real time as the data is coming in. So we can see that there's two dot uh, Ukraine domains, banana.dp and jomo.in.ua. It's like an Indian, Ukrainian, I don't know what that is. But uh, there's traffic going to these uh, uh, kind of bulk traffic starting to go to these uh, suspicious domains. And we can watch uh, as that kind of traffic grows in real time. And uh, this map up here lets us see geographically where the uh, alerts are, uh, are targeting to. So you can go and see the different parts of the world. Uh, looks like Western Europe is maybe uh, they're going to you and your, your home here in England. No, nope, Amsterdam. So you can kind of watch in real time in a variety of different ways uh, from a network perspective, a geographic perspective, uh, et cetera, kind of where these, uh, these alerts are kind of triggering and where they're targeting. And so as this uh, attack starts to progress, we can now see that the uh, red dot is about to uh, kind of encroach on the, the green dot. So we see a clear uh, growth in the uh, percentage of alerts. And we're up to about 16% of actually all the outbound traffic is now triggering Metron alerts. And uh, another thing that's interesting is to look at the mappings between the internal hosts that are generating this traffic. So this heat map at the bottom is showing us the, core, the, um, the uh, uh, mappings between the internal IP addresses that are starting to generate some of this suspicious traffic and those uh, outbound IPs or uh, upon URLs, in this case, that are being uh, targeted. And we can see that it looks like most of the traffic is coming from a dot one internal host going to banana, um, but it's starting to look like uh, maybe it's spreading to other internal hosts. We see now have a 200 and 202 and 203 host also starting to generate traffic to these two uh, suspicious domains. And then the uh, kind of last thing to look at here is this uh, link uh, force-directed graph link. And this is actually showing us kind of in a visual format the uh, sites in uh, blue squares. So we can see the two sites that are triggering these alerts. And then the, blue dot, uh, the black dots are the uh, hosts that are sending traffic to those. And uh, as this uh, situation evolves, the uh, visual continuously uh, updates. And we actually saw, it, I think, just another, a new, another host just joined this, uh, this attack pattern. So it um, seems like there's an attack underway on this uh, network. It seems to be uh, spreading kind of uh, rapidly. So um, what we should probably do is go into Metron and really look at the details of some of these uh, attack line items so we can try to stop them. And to do that, we will go to the uh, Metron alerts interface. So we can access through this quick link here. And this, in, uh, you want to describe this part, uh, Simon? You're more familiar with it than I am. Yeah, sure. So this is the, uh, this is the alerts interface that we have in Metron. This is essentially designed to look at all the events and alerts which have come into Metron and provide you with a search style interface to be able to go through those. So one of the things you'll see here is that uh, you know, we, we've got a series of these squid proxy alerts. Uh, yeah, and hey, that's a familiar IP address, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And uh, you see those, those alerts have been scored by that threat triage configuration that we saw earlier. Uh, we can also start to pull up some of the detail around here. So one of the key things around the enrichment process that Metron 
uh, uh, goes through is that it's intended to bring together all of the information that an analyst would need to investigate that alert, be it through a visual mechanism like Zoom or be it through you know, digging right down into the individual raw data item uh, yeah, through this interface. Uh, and that should have all the context that they need to be able to actually deal with an incident or triage an incident in there. Uh, there are also a couple of other things that we can do here. We can do some uh, simple kind of slice and dice pivot and grouping here. So uh, yeah, we'll find uh, yeah, very few of those uh, yeah, UA uh, locations that we found. This is actually from the geo enrichment piece. Uh, and we can group that at various, actually you know what, the source address is probably more relevant for that. We can start to group these alerts together uh, based on the, the source addresses, actually the source address, we've got quite a lot of source addresses there, but yeah, that one looks like a bad one. Um, <laughs> they sorted the wrong way. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we can also then merge those alerts together so that when we've got a bunch of things which we identify are part of the same incident, we can just kind of collapse those down into a single alert uh, so that we can deal with them as, yeah, as an incident in themselves. Again, you kind of pivot around different dimensions on this as well. Uh, this will start to, uh, yeah, this will start to build out uh, searches for you as well, so you can see that you've got the, the click interaction to be able to uh, build up your search interactively uh, through that to be able to explore some of the log thing, uh, messages around a particular piece and just kind of essentially just play with that list of data itself. Yep. And uh, so what you can do with that then is find uh, one of the uh, alerts that is uh, triggering right now, and then we can use the alert uh, case management system inside of Metron Alerts to actually escalate this to other people. So we could escalate one of these tickets, we could add comments like, uh, you know, block this domain, stuff like that, and we could send that off to the network operations folks so they could start to counteract uh, this attack. I will counteract this attack by control seeing my terminal, which should uh, also effectively, oops, maybe not. Maybe I can't stop the attack, Simon. It's <laughs> underway. Oh, keyboard up. interrupt. Yeah. Okay, sorry, Wi-Fi delay. Okay, attack is stopped. Uh, so now I've uh, I've stopped this attack, and uh, if we watch this uh, graph for a minute longer, we'll start to see that the uh, the green line will pop back up, and the uh, the attack will start to uh, to fade from the system. So we can kind of watch in real time as the system recovers. And another quick thing I'll show here is is this time bar at the bottom has a feature we call the data DVR, and it's kind of like your home DVR. You can watch TV live. You can pause, rewind, fast forward. So I'm going to actually uh, rewind to before this attack began. So you can kind of rewind the whole system to that point, and we could uh, then replay the attack either uh, in uh, real-time speed or we could fast forward through the attack. So now I'm playing at a speed of one minute per second, and uh, we can watch the entire attack again in, uh, in fast forward uh, in kind of, or pause and even slow motion. So we kind of drill in and try to really understand kind of where it started and where it, where it came from. The kind of DV, data DVR is kind of useful in that cyber kind of world quite often. Gives you a nice experience for your forensic investigators who are looking at, you know, being able to look at something after the fact uh, becomes incredibly valuable for them because, yeah, if you're under a huge botnet attack, the impetus is generally stop it as fast as possible, not necessarily look at the deep subtleties of how it originated. So once you can look Stick through things like the data yeah. DVR, then you can start to see some of the kind of ways in which that was triggered and start to look at improving your defense against future attacks through that means as well. Yep. So we wanted to show you another example of, you know, we've seen how this kind of platform handles things which are basically based on scale, right? So yeah, a, a, a DDoS attack or a botnet attack is usually fairly easy to spot because there's a lot of it. However, there's another class of problems in cybersecurity which are more focused on finding that kind of, you have a proverbial needle in the haystack. Uh, someone, uh, someone at our meetup on Monday came up with a great expression of this and you know, pointed out that they are looking for the anomalies in the anomalies. You know, they're looking for the very, very small amount of data in that long tail problem of, you know, of a huge quantity of what's basically <coughs> noise. So uh, we're gonna show you uh, another demonstration of another feature of uh, the Zoom integration which is based around uh, some of uh, some authentication data, and this authentication data, uh, yeah, comes from a a known attack uh, data set published by Los Alamos National Labs. And uh, actually, I think yeah, I'll just hand it over to you, Justin, and let you. Uh, okay, great. Yep. So see this. See if we can find the hacker. Uh, yeah. So can anyone tell me where the hacker is here? Anyone figure it out yet? So you all have this, as uh, Simon mentioned, this uh, neural network in your head that can use your visual system to 
look at something like this, you don't even have to know what it is, but you can start to look for unusual patterns. Uh, what this is, is the blue dots are, blue squares are servers, and the black dots are users. And does anyone see any patterns that look unusual that might be the hacker? Who's found the hacker? Where? Blue dot to blue dot line. Blue square to blue square. Well, that's interesting. Why the servers talk to each other without users? That might be something to look into. Um, anyone else see anything kind of abnormal in here? Off to the right. Yeah, what's he doing over here? Why is there, uh, why are there some users talking to the server, but literally these users are talking to no other servers, and this uh, server's not talking to any other users? Like, that's always uh, suspicious when you see people off in the corner kind of canoodling with each other uh, and not interacting with the rest of the world. That's uh, often in the government space, we look, look for that a lot of stuff. That one's under my desk. Yeah, that's, that's Simon's. <laughs> Actually, if we uh, zoom in on what that is, if we look at the details, this is local service and network service, um, and uh, there's obviously something going on here with some local services. Maybe you're not staying as local as they should. Uh, then the rest of this pattern, if you look at it, it, like you see a lot of kind of halos of users kind of going into single servers. So maybe these are application users or departmental users going into their servers. You know, there's some users that go into two adjacent servers. So maybe they just happen to be using two applications that are adjacent. See that kind of pattern around the edges here. Uh, in the middle, you see this mishmash of who knows what this is. Like our, our human brains are terrible at trying to understand what this means. Uh, it's probably just like all the sysadmins like doing their, doing their stuff. Um, so we might need to filter that down a little bit before we can really understand visually th what that is. But just at a high level gestalt, what kind of really uh, looks kind of really abnormal is these things that look like the opposite pattern. So there's this pinwheel down here, which is kind of the opposite of the regular pattern. So the rest of these are all black dots going into blue squares. And you know, a kindergartner could tell you this is, the, this is one of these things does not look like the other, right? This is uh, blue squares going into a small black dot. Uh, so you know, what is, what is happening here? And uh, this is, if you mouse over it, we see this is user, uh, user 66 uh, going into all these servers. And you see relatively few uh, attempts to go into these, uh, these servers. So maybe there's something to look into there. And then another strange pattern also is kind of here at the bottom of the visual. And this one's different because it's um, a lot thinner. So we see a lot smaller dots and we see thinner lines, meaning fewer attempts uh, to connect. And if we kind of mouse over that, we see the server is called TGT. Does anyone know what that is? TGT? Ticket generation, yeah. It's a Kerberos ticket generation server. So if you, know, if you know how Kerberos tickets work, like you get one ticket and generally they live for a while uh, before they expire. So it makes it kind of just makes sense to us. Like, okay, we're not worried about that because that's how Kerberos is supposed to work. It's the ticket server. That looks kind of normal. So um, just by looking at these kind of patterns, just even at the, all this is all the data just rendered here on the screen. Like we're, we as humans are pretty good at starting to figure some stuff out that we want to look into. And where it gets really powerful is start to combine uh, the machine learning aspects of Metron with our human capabilities to recognize unusual patterns. And that's what we can do with these slicers over here. So Metron has a concept of alerts. We were showing the alerts earlier on that HTTP traffic. Metron was alerting on some of those uh, suspicious actors, uh, activities. And it's done the same thing here with these login attempts. There's a series of machine learning processes that happened underneath the scenes in Metron, which uh, have triggered alerts for some of these login attempts. And so right now, if I turn on the slicer and say alert uh, true, we can see that it's filtered down the visual to, uh, it's removed all the normal stuff from the machine learning system's perspective, including a lot of the stuff that we as humans also kind of observed as normal. And it's left us with, uh, with two kind of main patterns to look at here. Uh, the first pattern, guess what? It's that same exact one that we found before with user 66. So uh, machine learning picked that up uh, same way we did. Uh, but it's also kind of picked up another kind of interesting pattern, which if you kind of flip back and forth a couple times, you actually realize is embedded in kind of all that noise in the center that we were driving our, our human brains uh, crazy trying to figure out. But by kind of using machine learning to filter this out, we see that there's one big black uh, dot here in the center. And if we mouse over that, we see it's the anonymous login. And who's the anonymous login? And why are they going to these, uh, these servers? You might want to know. So that's kind of, is a, you know, the machine learning has triggered in on something that says these, these anonymous login attempts look kind of unusual and that's something we should probably you know, go back again to the raw details to really understand in, in more detail. Uh, so that's kind of, a, a, kind of a, a neat example. If we filter it down uh, more, we can just search for interesting things. Like if we knew coming in that this user 66 was something we wanted to look into, we could just type in like U6, U66, and this is just done, run a quick search against all the fields across all the data. Uh, and then lets us just multi-select the things we want to start to filter the system down to. It's really anything that you think you might be looking for as a human, you can just kind of type in, and uh, it'll start to allow you to, uh, to filter down the data accordingly. 
Um, and then you can link back and forth to the Metron uh, alerts interface in that case management system in order to escalate cases and to look into things in more detail. So of course, for anyone who's familiar with a, a data science type approach, uh, yeah, might, might have some insight into how we started to create the machine learning that detected that user 66 problem. And what we did was we essentially started with the visualization in the Zoom data platform. We were looking at those kind of links, looking at those unusual patterns, and getting a human to kind of intuit what was interesting about that uh, first off. What we were then able to do is once we'd established that there was something suspicious in that exploratory analysis, we built out profiles in Metron and then which, which then apply against baselines against peer groups to be able to start to automate that insight that we got from the visualization. So we looked at it first and we realized that, okay, this is weird behavior. This is the kind of behavior that we want to stop and that we want to catch. We then automated that into Metron, creating rules and profiles based on that human insight so that we can then automatically act on that. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the escalate function that we saw earlier, for example, in some of that case management piece in the Metron UI allows us to then also integrate into other response systems as well. So once you've gone from that initial, I'm hunting around in my visual environment, I've now found some real insight which I can codify into the platform, which I can then execute again in, in real time against very, very high volume feeds. I can then turn that into automated response. So for example, we have some people who've seen that yeah, from the initial exploration, they've discovered that there are certain high indicators of uh, ransomware, for example. They turn those into profiles and alerts in Metron, which then automates that process that we humans uh, manage to do just by looking at it, and then turns that into a direct action, such as uh, yeah, removing a virtual desktop environment, or uh, closing a switch port, for example, or immediately closing that stuff off automatically. So you can go from using that human in the loop analytics to machine augmented human in the loop analytics to <coughs> pure machine automation so that you're actually responding in the machine time without a human having to look at it at the end for those kind of clear insights that you've got from the original visualization. Yeah, it makes sense to let the machines make some decisions. Like, do you want air airbag deploy? Yes, no. Like, don't stop and ask the operator, right? You just do it if the car thinks it's the right thing to do. So that's kind of, you know, the uh, kind of things you do want to automate, but also keep the human uh, at least keeping track of those things to make sure that's not going off the rails. That's what we're yeah. uh, going to be around here for. Uh, I think that's, that's so. Yeah, any questions? That's what we have. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks. <clears throat> and do we have some time for some questions? Uh, one question. One oh, question. Who Sorry. has the question? Who has the fastest question? We might get two. <laughs> <laughs> So the question was, which uh, ML algorithms are we using to detect anomalies? Uh, in this instance, we actually got an awfully long way with a very simple baselining algorithm. So the way that the uh, behavior profiler works is it builds up uh, models of behavior uh, by time slices, uh, which we can then uh, select in intriguing periods, like you know, uh, yeah, weekdays only, or skipping uh, anomalous days like holidays, for example. Um, what, we, uh, what we then do in this instance is we use uh, a departure of a set of standard deviations calibrated against a peer group. So it's a very simple univariate learned time series model uh, in this particular instance. Uh, for, uh, and and it, it's actually quite impressive how far you can get with simple traditional what, uh, what many vendors will call machine learning. I would probably just call basic statistics uh, at this point. Yeah. Uh, we do, uh, yeah, for the harder to find things, we do also apply a variety of machine learning algorithms. Uh, the key algorithms that we tend to provide out of a box for, with things like Metron include things like MAD, so mean absolute deviation algorithms. Uh, yeah, everything Metron is focused very much on that real time, uh, high speed approach. Uh, we're also uh, adding in, yeah, there are pending experimental algorithms around a robust PCA, which was an algorithm uh, that they did quite a lot of research uh, Netflix on. Also, an algorithm called RAD, uh, which again is something which came out of a streaming paper at Netflix to do generic anomaly detection on streams at very high speed in a very scalable way. But what, we've, what we tend to focus on is using the scalability and power of a platform and the ability to deeply personalize 
those profiles and deeply personalize uh, the other uh, peer groupings of those profiles so that actually you can effectively use the, um, yeah, it's, it's gone slightly out of fashion as a term these days, but the unreasonable effectiveness of big data uh, was a thing, and it turns out still is. Math still works, uh, <laughs> yeah, even in the worlds of GPU. <laughs> Uh, and then, yeah, if, if we need to go deeper than that, yeah, that usually gets us kind of 80, 90% of the way to a right answer. What we then do is we apply uh, yeah, more complex models. We have a mechanism in Metron which allows us to plug in arbitrary models, including anything from something like, uh, even something like a scikit-learn model that doesn't parallelize. We can parallelize the inference of that. Uh, this is a whole other talk of it. Uh, so, yeah, we, we use um, a piece of a platform called Model as a Service to effectively pseudo parallelize unparallelizable models so that we can uh, yeah, apply essentially any uh, anomaly detection algorithm you like. Great. I think we're getting signal to wrap up. Yeah. So, uh, thank you, everybody. <laughs>